know that you're a phoenix, so rise up from all those ashes today. Yeah, you were scarred, but you were czar. You can call to the grave. I know you know that a lion's inside, sleeping in your heart. Step back and remember who you are. All right, so this is part three of my Amari Volume 2 Leon explained videos. I have already broken down the general concepts uh, and important points for the project itself, as well as all of the background information, lyrics, themes, concepts, etc., for the singles in previous videos, part one and part two. This is going to be for the B sides. So, this is the B sides video. All three of the B sides are going to be explained in this video. I would greatly recommend that you watch the first two parts of this series of videos to really understand some of the stuff that's going to be referenced and talked about in this third video but if not then okay hopefully it's still not confusing to you uh and again thank you so much for watching these videos listening to the songs themselves and just being interested in the project so hopefully these videos are worth it for you so without further ado let's get into this Okay, so the first of the B-sides that we're getting into is Under the Moonlight because we're just following the track list straight on down. So this is the fourth song on the project. The inspiration for this song is the iconic Can You Feel the Love Tonight scene where Nala and Simba turn a bunch of 90s babies into furries. I'm kidding. All jokes aside, the scenes where Nala and Simba see each other again for the first time in years, which leads to a montage and eventual culmination of love under the moonlight is what inspired this song this song's title is also foreshadowed in the song red moon on volume one in the line this is a graveyard date under the moonlight but in this context it's represented in a more romantic and intimate way whereas in that song it's like petty and edgy and uh yeah yeah different vibe but still similar concepts the instrumentation of this song has many elements that are sonically light as a nod to well moonlight and these elements are panned all over the place enveloping the listener like light on a dark night envelops a person or new love can envelop a person the beat also includes the sound of bubbles popping as a percussive element in reference to the fact that one of the first scenes we see of nala is her I, actually i think it's the first scene we see of nala is her getting a bath from her mom while her bath doesn't actually include bubbles because she's a lion cub, human baths often include bubbles, and so I thought it was a cool Easter egg to embed into the song. Kiara, the daughter of Simba and Nala, who might have been conceived in the very scene that this song is referencing, also has a rather famous and funny bubble-related scene in Lion King 2 as well. Okay, lyrical breakdown. Verse 1. Twilight, pink skies, no blues. In the literal sense, the sky at twilight can be pink because of a phenomenon called scattering, where the shorter wavelength colors of blue and violets are scattered, leaving the longer wavelength yellows, oranges, and reds to be more visible. In a metaphorical sense though, a sky of pink can represent a happy and in love feeling as opposed to the blues, aka feelings of melancholy, sadness, and depression, or opposed to having dark skies hanging over you, which symbolize the same negative emotions but in a different metaphor, but still see the form Da Vinci drew. This is a reference to Da Vinci's most famous piece of art, the Mona Lisa, which for a long time was considered the most beautiful depiction of a woman ever. I strongly disagree with that assessment, but that is the actual reality of the situation. This line is basically saying, even with the sun going down, I can still see you're as beautiful as the Mona Lisa, or hopefully more beautiful. <laughs> this is a callback to my song Forever from volume one, where I say, our home is the Louvre, your beauty on grand display, which is also a reference to the Mona Lisa as the Mona Lisa is housed in the French art museum, the Louvre. Also notice that the first line of the verses starts as twilight, and then the song develops like metaphorically in a way that lyrically pushes it towards nighttime in the choruses. You're not the norm, there's no way to construe. There's no way to compare the one you love to anything else since your love for them makes everything about them feel anything but average. Or I guess it's the chicken and the egg situation. Nothing about them is average, which is why you love them. But now that you love them, everything about them feels even more fantastical. Whatever the case may be, that's the, the meaning of this line. I'm caught in the trance of you. When you're in the honeymoon phase of your relationship, it really feels like you're floating in a trance. They are perfect. Everything is perfect. The skies are all pink. It's 
It's beautiful. The night's cold, but your love's warm. Hearts beating like shrews. Shrews have the fastest heartbeats of any mammal in the world, even faster than hummingbirds, which are famously known for their fast heartbeats. This line means that love from the right person can metaphorically warm you, even on the coldest nights, and that love will cause your hearts to beat really fast. This is also a double entendre in the literal sense, as in this can be interpreted in a sexual way. And I'll just leave it there. You silent storms brought back the scenic views. Sometimes being in the presence of a person you love can make you feel better even during the worst of times and bring back the feeling of peace or in this case, scenic views. Chorus. Okay, so I'm just gonna like read the whole chorus cause it's not that long and then I'll explain the whole thing. Under the moonlight tonight, stars and hearts shimmering, you illuminate who I am, you're a backlight, brightened my midnights. The chorus compares love to shimmering stars and Nala to a backlight, which is a spotlight that illuminates a photographic subject from behind, all of which cause darker things to become illuminated via their presence. It also sounds a bit like I said, black light, which would also work in the context of the meaning of the chorus, but gives a bit of a gross vibe because you know, black lights, which is why I opted for backlight instead. The general concept of illuminating things that were there but you couldn't see before is still present though. The only other object mentioned in the chorus is moonlight, which is another thing that provides illumination during dark times. Love can be a very therapeutic force in a person's life and this illuminating imagery is meant to reference that. Nala was the one who started the ball rolling on getting Simba to remember that he was meant to be a king and in turn pushed him towards self-actualization and healing of the darkness that was within him. Her figuratively standing behind Simba not only caused him to fall in love with her, i.e. caused his heart to shimmer like stars at night, but also helped him see who he was meant to be all along, like illumination. Verse two also starts off with the, the twilight, pink skies, new blues thing. And then a new love, but we know that it accrues like time in a queue, wet shampoo, new bamboo, much more of it will ensue. This means that when the relationship is right, you can tell early on that your love for this person will only continue to grow from here. I then relate this to three things. One, waiting in a queue. A reference to the feeling of something lasting forever and never seeming to end. Like the agony of being stuck waiting in line, but in this case, the feeling that's lasting forever is the feeling of love, not agony. Number two, wet shampoo. Shampoo starts out small, but once it gets wet, it foams up to occupy a space much larger than the original amount that you had. And so the idea here is that as your love for this person grows, it occupies a much bigger portion of your heart than they originally had. Number three, new bamboo. This is a reference to the fact that Chinese bamboo doesn't break the surface for the first four years of its life, but then grows almost a hundred feet tall in a matter of weeks in that fifth year. The idea here is that while the young bamboo may not be large yet, it still has the potential to grow to be massive. So like each of those basically talks about like the growth of things in, in different uh, ways ways in which things can can accrue can become more but differently and then relates all of those things back to love i'm caught in this trance in lieu of sinking down in the stew you changed up the brew now life tastes so brand new it's delicious like fondue this is one big metaphor comparing the feeling of being in love and how it shifts your perspective about life Two, good food, which is something that's often associated with romance. A stew is a combination of larger cut ingredients like vegetables, meat, or fish that are just barely covered with cooking liquid and simmered over low heat for a long period of time. Similarly, pain is often left barely submerged under the surface, simmering for a long period of time. And so stew felt like an apt comparison to that pain. Fondue is a Swiss melted cheese and wine dish served in a communal pot heated with a candle or spirit lamp eaten by dipping bread into the cheese using long stemmed forks. While fondue also involves submerging food in hot liquid, it is considered a romantic dish, especially chocolate fondue. I, I, never had it but i've just seen chocolate fondue like referenced all the time in movies and stuff 
And so I used it to contrast the energetic shift that Simba went through before and after falling in love. So before it was Stu, which is not necessarily bad, but for the purpose of this song is, is the bad kind of simmering in heated liquid. And then it flips to fondue, which is like the good romantic kind of simmering in heated liquid. The bridge. Inamarata. This is an Italian word that means in love, and it's the feminine version, so basically translates to a woman you're in love with. So the bridge starts off with a pet name for your lover. You speak to the, the king in me, now I can see a queen who you're meant to be. The idea of speaking to the king or queen in someone is a reference to the marriage advice that you should talk to your partner in a way that is respectful, but empowering and they should reciprocate in kind. In this case, it's a reference to the fact that Nala never once let Simba forget that he was a king and therefore should act accordingly. As a result, she helped draw that king out of him. This process helped show Simba that she wasn't just a friend, but had the qualities he needed in his queen. Also, he hadn't seen like a female of his species in God knows how long. Uh, so the first one who shows up is gonna look pretty hot. Anyway, that's the, the breakdown for Under the Moonlight. Again, it's a singing song, not a ton of lyrics, so the breakdown is much faster. Now to the next B-side, which is It Is Time. Okay, so quick reminder, this song's working title was Rafiki's Refrain, and the word refrain comes from the French referende. This old French term just means to repeat, and that's exactly what a refrain does. A refrain is a repeating line or verse used throughout a song, often with an accompanying melody particular to that line verse. So it's somewhat similar to a chorus, but it's not exactly the same thing, especially when your chorus doesn't repeat exactly. Um, although they're often used interchangeably because for the sake of catchiness, most choruses are just big refrains. The inspirations for this song are both of the scenes where Rafiki says, it is time. The first one is when he learns that Simba is alive, he says, it is time. Like when he smells like the dust and petals and whatever, he says, it is time, referring to the fact that it is time for Simba to come back and challenge Scar for the throne. And then later, after Simba overthrows Scar, Rafiki tells Simba, to his face, it is time, implying that it is time for him to step into who he was destined to be and take his rightful place as King of the Pride. If you are musically inclined, you might notice this and the song inspired by Mufasa, which is the next song we'll get to, have essentially the same BPM, which, which is beats per minute, which is the tempo of the, the song, at about 100 beats per minute. One of them is 100 beats per minute and the other one is 99. I think this one is 99 and the other one is 100. But yeah, they have essentially the same tempo. This was a slight nod tying the two songs together that were inspired by two characters who seemed to be really in sync and complemented each other personality wise. So this is like another example of me doing like background, like music theory stuff that tied certain songs together because the characters that they were inspired by were also tied together in specific ways. Rafiki always struck me as a playful but kind of wacky dude, and I wanted the beat to match that vibe. One of the ways I did that was by including a Halloween sounding lead melody. Uh, so that's like that. I forget what, what instrument it is, but I think it's like a marimba or, or something. And of course, by adding the laughing in the bridge and the outro, which is one of Rafiki's most notable quirks. For the record, that is not Rafiki's actual laugh in any movie or show or play or whatever. Those are creepy clown laugh <laughs> sound effects that I edited to make fit well with the sound of the song. Another thematic sound effect is the clock ticking Foley, which Foley is like the, uh, it's like sound effects of like everyday life stuff. Foley, I added to the outro, a nod to this song being about time. This also relates to a song I have on volume three, but that's obviously not out yet. So I'll just dangle that Easter egg out there and let you all put it together when the time comes. There's actually a bunch of stuff that I, I didn't like talk about leading up to this point that relates to, to stuff in volume three, but I decided to write that here in a more blatant way. But yeah, so far I haven't like been like wink, wink, nudge, nudging every single time, but uh, there's I, my projects are connected. Even if on the surface, they don't seem connected, like in the background, the, the minutia of them that have connecting points. Okay, lyrical breakdown. 
As this song was originally intended to be a refrain, I challenged myself to say a lot with a small amount of lyrics, so this lyrical breakdown is probably going to be longer than you might be anticipating given the small amount of lyrics, like in the actual song. Uh, but yeah, so prepare to have your mind blown. I'm kidding. Okay, the chorus. This chorus has two separate interpretations that essentially lead you to the same meaning uh, or the same like general overall concept, but in very different ways. And so I will explain the entire course through one lens, which is the first interpretation, and then I will start over and explain it again through the other lens. Madman, dude, why, why do you do this to yourself? I think writing like this is more interesting. Just to be clear, I don't have to write like in this like super complex nuanced layered way with like all these different meanings and interconnected points or whatever especially because i know like most people aren't going to pick up on this stuff and most people aren't going to watch this video to have me tell it to them but for the the few people who are wired like me who are interested in like all the like deeper meanings and nuance and and all that stuff that's why i i do this i do it for me but also for you guys because uh I find it music more interesting when it's it's like that. And so hopefully you guys do as well. Okay, interpretation one, a weather nature metaphor. Don't need a wishbone, just start climbing. Okay, first, let me start by explaining like what a wishbone is and, and the history of wishbones so you can actually understand why I'm talking about them. Okay, the wishbone is a Y-shaped bone that's the fusion of two clavicles called the furcula located right between the neck and breast of a bird. Around 700 BCE, the, oh Jesus, I'm gonna butcher this. The Etruscans, I can't pronounce this, they're from Italy. That's literally what I wrote because I knew I was gonna butcher that. Believed the birds were oracles that could see the future. Whenever they butchered a chicken, they would leave the furcula in the sun to dry out, preserving it in hopes of gaining some of its powers. Villagers would then pick up the furcula and gently stroke it while making a wish, giving it its more common name the wishbone. Legend has it that the Romans then picked up the superstition. You knew there was going to be some more Roman references, right? Legend has it that the Romans picked up this superstition. However, chickens were scarce and in turn, so were their wishbones. People had to resort to cracking the bones in half so that there were enough to go around. Later, the Romans passed this wishbone cracking tradition to the British when they like invaded, who then carried it over with them to the US when they invaded. <laughs> which is how I learned of it, because I'm an American. As this new land was abundant with wild turkeys, I, in fact, I think we have like wild turkeys out in my yard right now, like a ton of turkeys when you live in certain parts of the country. People began using turkey wishbones for luck. Okay, I'm just gonna start this sentence over because it, it doesn't make sense with me interjecting halfway through. As this new land was abundant with wild turkeys, people began using turkey wishbones for luck instead of chicken ones by two people hooking their pinky finger around each end and making a wish and pulling. Whoever ends up with the bigger piece, like once it's broken, will have their wish come true. Breaking turkey wish bones to make wishes has since become a core part of American holiday tradition, which is why I am explaining all of this. I'm sure all of the Americans are like, no duh, but everyone else on earth who's not American isn't just gonna know all of our customs so that I'm explaining it for them, okay? Okay. Um, breaking turkey wish bones to make wishes has since become a core part of American holiday tradition. This line is meant to say that Luck, wishes, and magic are not needed when growing past your pain. All you have to do is just start climbing like a plant that just starts growing wherever it happens to be planted. Then ignite the night. The metaphor here is that when one becomes who they're meant to be, it brings a warmth and light. Eh, eh, see that, that the same recurring motif? Within them that's akin to lighting a fire on a dark night. Light is also one of the main things needed for plants to grow, something that is referenced later in the chorus. This is example number, I don't know, a hundred of me referencing light metaphorically, and I will absolutely continue to do so in the future, so keep an eye out for that. It is time that you overcome, let go of that pain, don't check the clock, perfect timing. This line obviously references a clock, one of the most common timekeeping devices, and says that it's not necessary when deciding what time is right for healing and growth. This ties into the nature metaphor because plants don't decide to grow based on the time on a clock, but instead use an internal clock, or you could say it's like a, a solar clock, or however you wanna say it, they're not looking at the clock choosing to grow. You don't have to look at the clock to choose to grow. Just decide to. A rose grew from the stone and it's still shining. This is a reference to the famous poem, The Rose That Grew From Concrete by Tupac Shakur. Yeah, 
that Tupac. I literally wore this shirt just for that moment. So hopefully that, that was like, oh my goodness to you, because if it wasn't, then well, I should I guess I could award something else. Anyway, uh, the, the poem goes as follows. Did you hear about the rose that grew from a crack in the concrete? Proving nature's law is wrong, it learned to walk without having feet. Funny it seems, but by keeping its dreams, it learned to breathe fresh air. Long live the rose that grew from concrete when no one else cared. <laughs> this poem has always resonated with me as the poem represents the way in which someone can become something great, even while coming from a place that's difficult and without having the support you'd expect them to need to be great. It alternatively and symbolically reflects the ability of a person to break through barriers in order to become the individual they want to be in spite of seemingly insurmountable odds. It is time, here comes the rain. The idea behind this line is that for a plant like a rose to grow, it needs rain as well as light, something mentioned earlier. And so together, the chorus, via this interpretation, is saying it's now time for you to grow past the pain and circumstance you've been given, however rocky that may have been, like a plant growing out of stone, concrete, etc. Okay, interpretation two. Disney movie references. This second interpretation of the course is a series of references to Disney movie scenes or characters. They're mostly Lion King references, but there's also tidbits from one other Disney movie in here. Um, and you're like, wait, what? Yes, stick with me here. Don't need a wishbone, a reference to Rafiki, the main inspirational character of this song, who is a kooky shaman and used nature and food-based mysticism in the Lion King. Breaking wishbones is also nature-based food-based mysticism. Just start climbing, then ignite the night. A reference to the night battle between Simba and Scar, where Simba has to climb Pride Rock to fight Scar for the throne, during which the entire area gets engulfed in flames due to that lightning we talked about in Long Live the King. It is time that you overcome, let go of that pain. This is a reference to the first time Rafiki says, it is time, after discovering that Simba is still alive. He's essentially saying that it is time for Simba to work through his trauma. Whether he realizes that or not is, is up to your interpretation, but that is essentially what he's saying. Don't you check the clock, perfect timing. Switching movies, this line is in reference to Cogsworth, the living clock character from Beauty and the Beast, and sets up the next line. A rose grew from the stone and it's still shining. A rose truly growing out of a stone would be magical, just like the magical rose in Beauty and the Beast. The whole plot of the movie is that Beast, uh, spoiler alerts for a movie that's like, I don't know, 30 years old, I don't know how old Beauty and the Beast is, but like spoiler alert, cause I'm gonna kind of spoil this here. The whole plot of the movie is that Beast has to learn to love something else and they love him back before the rose stops shining and wilts. If not, he's gonna be stuck as the Beast forever. If so, he's gonna turn into a hunky prince, okay? Uh, in this case though, this song is about self-love instead of like romantic love. And so the line basically means there's still time for you to learn to love yourself. The rose has not withered yet, which again, the withering of the rose in Beauty of the Beast means your time is up for like getting that love versus here it's saying the time isn't up. The rose hasn't withered, the magical rose. You can still learn to love yourself. It is time, here comes the rain. Switching back to the Lion King again, this line is in reference to the second time Rafiki says it is time, this time saying it directly to Simba after defeating Scar, telling him it is time for him to ascend to the throne and begin his time as king. If you look at the lyrics of this song, you'll see that the word rain here is spelled R-E-I-G-N instead of rain, like from the sky, R-A-I-N. This line takes advantage of the homophone of rain, the water that falls from the sky during storms, and rain, the period during which a royal monarch rules. This is a callback to Prince, my debut song that also makes use of this homophone via the line, I'm seeing purple rain from the sky, while referencing the artist Prince and his famous song slash movie, Purple Rain, as well as a reference to the song, Long Live the King, that appears earlier on this project that also uses this homophone in the line, a hurricane, my winds shifting, bringing brand new rain. I really like this homophone and enjoy spinning it in different ways, which is why I've used it three times across two projects so far. Verse one, stick with me here because this might be a little out there for you to get until I finish explaining it. The lyrics to the verses of this song include sections that have lines which make use of the ooh and ah rhyming sounds in that order. 
so that the internal and in rhymes of certain lines in verse one go ooh, 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 and certain lines in verse two go ah, 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 which is a reference to the onomatopoeia, which is like a, a sound effect for the sound a monkey makes, which is ooh, ooh, ah, ah, as a conceptual nod to the fact that this song is inspired by a character who is a mandrel and mandrels are the largest species of monkeys in the world. So basically, without you knowing it, when you sing this song, you are saying ooh, ooh, ah, ah, which is like my little embedded conceptual nod to Rafiki and his species. And he's a mandrel. He's not a baboon, just for the record. He's referred to as a baboon and I think like the first movie and then they like retcon it and like actually accurately portray him. The, the colors and stuff on his face it very clearly indicate that he's a male mandrel because that's how their faces look. Even if he was a baboon, this like kind of conceptual nod still works because baboons are primates, but mandrels are specifically monkeys, like the largest monkeys on earth. So it like, it has extra weight. And I want you guys to know that I didn't miss species him. I don't, I don't know. You get what I'm saying. He's a mandrel. Okay. Verse one. The past is behind you now, so you can disavow all the pain you've been through on this route to become the real you. This section is basically saying everything you've been through is in the past, and so you can now let it all go, including the pain it's brought you. Look up, the sky has a message for you. This convo tonight will change up your worldview. This is a reference to Simba talking to Mufasa's spirit in the sky, and that one combo, along with his combo with Rafiki, which you could argue is the same combo, whatever, changes the trajectory of the rest of his life. I reference this in the Rafiki song and not the Mufasa song because, well, it fit better here. And because Rafiki is the reason Simba was even able to communicate with Mufasa's spirit at all. And also the it is time scenes kind of like sandwich that communication with Mufasa. Like one happens right before it and another one happens somewhat right after it. So it works. Dust off yourself, not stuck on the shelf. Stop floating like kelp. Kelp is a type of seaweed, which of course floats in the ocean. The idea of these lines is to say you aren't stuck or prisoner to the circumstances around you. You're free to move forward. This obviously takes the rose metaphor about growth from the chorus and kind of flips it on its head. Dust is also how Rafiki was able to realize that Simba was still alive. So I wanted to reference dust at some point in the song. Hope these words impact like welts cause. Welts occur when blunt force is applied to the body with elongated objects without sharp edges, i.e. welts are a type of bruise you get when impacted by something hard. This line means that the goal of this verse and of this song is to impact you hard enough to leave a mark upon you. Verse two, again, this is the, the ah, 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 ah part of the ooh, ooh, ah, ah reference embedding thing that I did. My look how you've grown. Uh, this verse talks about how a person has grown from being self-conscious and depressed to being confident and shining like a star. Those seeds of doubt were deeply sown. Sowing a seed means to cause an idea, feeling, etc., to be in someone's mind. In this case, the feeling of self-doubt had been deeply sown in Simba's mind. This line connects to the last line via both using a plant gardening metaphor, but communicating basically opposing concepts. Used to lay him prone, face down in dirt, a raw gemstone. Prone means to lie flat and face down, and the meaning of this was that Simba's confidence was so low that he'd metaphorically have his face in the dirt. It's kind of like when people are like, why the long face to horses? You know, that kind of thing. But in this case, it's because his confidence was low. Um, have his face in the dirt like a gemstone that hasn't been mined yet. It's also a reference to the fact that when Timon and Pumbaa found Simba, he was literally face down in dirt about to die. In this line, I use the same metaphor from Remember Who You Are, which has the lines, you're a diamond in a mine, high PSI, it's only tough on you so you got something they can't pry, da 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 take the dirt and wash it off like undried dye. But instead, takes the crystal and dirt metaphor in a different direction. This time saying that the person was face down in the dirt due to negative circumstance and a lack of confidence. This also connects with the previous line because seeds are sown in dirt and gemstones are found in dirt. Confidence was low, just like a baritone. Coming from the Greek term beritonis, meaning heavy sounding or deep voice, baritone is the middle male voice in vocal music. So it's lower than a tenor, but it's higher than a bass. Now your shoulders back. Having your shoulders back is a sign of being comfortable and confident. Life's back on track. If someone or something 
is on track, they are acting or progressing in a way that is likely to result in success. You hold the cards now like dealers in blackjack. To hold all the cards means to be in a very strong or advantageous position. I relate this idiom to card dealers in the card game blackjack who start off the game with all of the cards in their possession. Sharp like lion claw, now your demons they can't gnaw cause you're bright just like a star that's at its peak, that's Ween's law. It's, and then it leads into the, the bridge. Ta you know, with the, with the little effect, okay. This breakdown is gonna be like real science-y, so uh, stick with me here. Ween's law tells us what wavelength an object's brightness is at its maximum. In other words, Ween's law tells us what color a star is brightest at. As the surface temperature rises, this peak intensity, brightness shifts towards the bluer end of the light spectrum. As the surface temperature decreases, this peak intensity, brightness, will shift towards the redder end of the spectrum. And this is why the hottest stars in the universe are blue and the coldest stars are red. And in fact, this like works for most things. As things get hotter, they get bluer, like towards white almost. And then as they get cold, as they get cooler, they shift towards the red end of the spectrum. Now, I'm not a physicist, so if I butcher the exact wording on that, then I'll let you guys well actually me in the comments, but that's the general idea of it. And keeping that in mind, this line is stating that even after everything you've been through, you're a star that's as bright as you could possibly be. And this leaves the demons, AKA your mental struggles that you are battling in awe at how you've been able to overcome said trauma. And that's it is time. Okay, so we are on to the last song. This is Everything the Light Touches. Technically the last song is the piano version of Remember Who You Are, but there's really not anything to explain about that that isn't already in the Remember Who You Are video. So this is the last section of the B-side video. Uh, the title of this song is in reference to the iconic scene where Mufasa was talking to Simba about their kingdom and what it means to be king. I had the hardest time writing this song out of any of the songs on this project because, like, writing the lyrics, I mean, because Mufasa is the character I relate to most and probably my favorite character in the series, so I felt a lot of pressure to do him justice. I'll let you guys be the judge on if I actually did that or not, but as a result of that pressure, I'm like, Figuring out what to say was harder. This song is diametrically opposed to Scar Song, basically in every way, even down to the tracklist positioning. Again, Scar Song is the first song on, on the project, Long Live the King, and then Mufasa Song is the last song on the project, which is this song. As they were made to highlight the fact that the characters they're inspired by are brothers, but are polar opposites personality-wise. Mufasa Song is more consistent with a general happy and warm vibe, and has a lot of intertwining parts to it, whereas Scar Song is dark, aggressive, ambitious, and a bit edgy, given that I wanted the music of the songs to represent their respective characters. In fact, this concept even extends to the keys of the song, where Mufasa song is in F major and Scar song is in F minor. Since major keys are known to be bright and happy sounding, while minor keys are known to be darker and moody sounding. And I chose the tone of center of F instead of A or B or C because F is the first letter in both of the words father and figure, so it's symbolic of Mufasa being much more of a positive male influence on the story slash Simba, while Scar was much more of a negative male influence on the story slash Simba. I wanted to make this song feel sunny because the title includes light and people are usually happy when it's sunny, uh, unless you live in a place that's like insanely hot, but just going with the, the symbolic nature of a sunny day. And so I went with steel drums for the main melody because steel drums are common in a whole bunch of countries where it's super sunny. They just have a magically happy sound to them and are often played while at the beach, which is a place where a lot of people feel most at peace or, or most happy. Chimes also have that same like fantastical magical vibe to them. So you know I had to sprinkle those bad boys in there. If you're musically inclined, you might notice that this song and the song inspired by Rafiki, which is the last song we just talked about, have essentially the same BPM beats per minute of 100 BPM. Now that I'm thinking about it, I really feel like this is the one that's 100 BPM and the other one is 99 BPM. But the point is, they're very close in BPM. As a slight nod, tying the two songs together that were inspired by two characters who seem to be really in sync and complemented each other personality-wise. One thing you may notice about the melodic top line of the vocal is that it weaves in and out of sync with the instrumentation. 
sometimes following the lead melody of the steel drums, sometimes following the bass line. And at one point in the verses, there's a part where the bass line, steel drum, lead melody, the vocal top line, the lyrics, everything syncs up together. The thought process behind this was I wanted every aspect of the track to feel like it not only worked in tandem, but was literally connected, moving and progressing as one whole, all working to create balance. This, of course, was to further drive home the symbolic narrative of balance and harmony that Mufasa always preached about. Okay, lyrical breakdown. This, I think this might be the shortest one out of the bunch. I don't know, we'll see. And yet I still somehow managed to fit a quadruple entendre in here. So stay tuned. <laughs> Chorus, the light touches everything we call home. So when you are grown, you will get to rule it all. This song references the iconic speech Mufasa gives Simba, where he explains the kingdom of their pride lands stretches as far as the eye can see, or as Mufasa so eloquently put it, everything the light touches is our kingdom. You want this, I know, yes the throne is in your genome. This is a reference to the fact that most kingdoms are hereditary, and therefore the next ruler is decided based on DNA, who's related to the current ruler, as is the case with the titular character's throne. So Simba was the prince and he was the crown prince, so the prince set to be king because he was the son of the current king. But you reap what you sow. This is a reference to the biblical scripture Galatians 6 and 7, which I'm pretty sure is the Apostle Paul, but I'm also not 100% sure on that. But I think it's the Apostle Paul, which basically means you get what you give or you get what you earn. Either way, same, same. And I used it to point out that a monarch is beloved not because of the title that they hold, but because of what they do for their people. And I feel like that's something that Mufasa really embodied and Scar really missed during his time as king. Like just being king in name doesn't mean people are going to love you, doesn't mean you're going to be adored, as Scar put it, and doesn't mean that like you deserve anything. What you do for the people is what decides what you deserve or not. The real job of a true king is to protect it all. I feel very strongly that it is the responsibility of those in power to look out for those under them. And I believe that Mufasa would have agreed with me on that point. Verse one, provide this is our responsibility. Being kings, not about how you can get what you want from the weak. This line is a continuation of the earlier point about those in power doing what's best for the people instead of taking advantage of them, which is kind of what this whole song is about. Working together is the key. So you must give from and of yourself. This is our duty. This is my reference to Mufasa's circle of life speech, where he describes the food chain and everything being built on a delicate balance that must be maintained. And so like everyone is contributing via their existence and also via their actions. And if any one part of that link gets thrown off balance, then the entire ecosystem falls apart, which is basically what you see happen when Scar is king. It seems you think the job is to rule and give decrees, but in reality, we provide for all, way down to the bees. This is a nod to how Simba originally viewed the role as king, as demonstrated by his conversation with Scar. Ironically, Scar also viewed the crown in the same immature way, so this song also acts as a deconstruction of why Scar was mentally unfit to lead. Shade, but also, again, the songs are diametrically opposed. And that's why this song is the last song, and not like the first song I could have put Scar song is the last song, but made this song the last song, like to put kind of like a bow on all of it. Like you've heard all of these different perspectives on why you should be king, why you are royal. This is like the, the petty victory lap of you being king, but like this is what it, being a, a real true king is actually about, uh, which is providing for others, you know, taking care of the people who depend on you, at least in my opinion. But what do I know? I'm, I'm just me. It's a big job. The pride lands stretch all the way to the sea but you can do it because all you need is held within thee. Thee is an old fashioned word for you when you are talking to only one person. While leading the right way is often difficult, especially leading a large amount of people, all you have to do is look within yourself and lean into doing what's best for everyone who depends on you. Verse two, this crown, it weighs more when you are fit to lead. This is a reference to the quote, uneasy lies the head that wears a crown from Shakespeare's King Henry IV part two, which means those charged with the responsibility of leadership carry a heavy burden that makes it difficult for them to relax. Or as Uncle Ben from Spider-Man put it, with great power comes great responsibility. My point with this line is to say that those who don't feel the responsibility of their leadership position are not fit to be leaders in the first place. I feel this way about many politicians as well as Scar, in fact, 
I feel this one line was the main thing that led Scar astray during his reign. Actually, side note, I feel like if Scar would have been a better king, even after murdering Mufasa, first off, nobody knew about that, so it didn't really matter, but even if people did know that he murdered Mufasa, the way that lion society works, like, they would have been cool with it if he didn't just suck at everything related to being a king. But because he didn't get this line, that that's what led him astray, you know? This also acts as yet another Shakespeare reference, tying in to the references made in volume one, most notably on Red Moon, again, like basically like 80% of that song ties into something in, in this project. Via the lines, now you know the tragedies as Shakespearean histories, with tragedies and histories both being two types of Shakespearean plays. That line is actually like more complex than like the quick little summary I just gave of it, but if you're interested in that, go listen to Red Moon and then go watch the explained video on that, which is also super, super long. I think it's actually longer than Long Live the King explained that I just did earlier, but I don't know. Point is, if I rap a super long time, the explained video gonna be crazy. Being King's not about being praised after you do one good deed. I put this in here as a shot at politicians specifically. It often feels like they will do one good thing and expect massive praise or try to ride that single accomplishment for the entirety of their term when in reality it's your job as a person in power to do what's best or do the best you can for the people scar never really got around to doing like any one good thing that he he rode on the coattails of so yeah this was just me taking a shot at politicians vote for amari 20 whenever I become a politician or whatever. You're let down, I know. Here's the thing. When you keep others first in your mind, we all will succeed. I'm aware the song is a bit preachy and kind of makes leading sound more like work or chore than play, but that's the whole point. Leading isn't all fun and games, but when done right, it's beneficial to everyone. True kings don't just sit back and fill themselves up on mead. Mead is an alcoholic beverage made by fermenting honey mixed with water and sometimes with added ingredients such as fruits, spices, grains, or hops. Mead was produced in ancient times throughout Europe, Africa, and Asia. The idea here is that any ruler who just sits back eating and drinking, like Scar, instead of actively leading his people into a brighter future, like Mufasa, is not a true king. Being kings not about laying flat while the wind blows like a reed. This line is a quadruple entendre. Yes, really. <laughs> I say yes, really. This is not even the only quadruple entendre on this project, but whatever. Just stick with me here. One, this line can be a reference to the reed plant, a tall, thin, grass-like plant that grows all over the world, including in Africa, which is where this movie takes place, and due to its flexible nature, bends as the wind blows by it. This interpretation has two meanings. So two of the of the four overall meanings come from keeping this form of reed in mind. First meaning, the wind could be blowing violently causing the plant to want to lay down due to the turbulence. However, you can't just lay down when the winds of a storm blow when you're king because you have responsibilities to your people. Second meaning, it could be a nice day and the wind is blowing ever so slightly making you want to lay down in the grass like a reed and do nothing but as king you can't just do that either <laughs> because whether it's a good day or a bad day you still have responsibilities to your people okay second reference so like shifting the the, the meaning of read but this is the third overall like meaning or interpretation is of a reference to the reed part of a woodwind instrument there are two main types of woodwind instruments flutes and reed instruments to play a reed instrument you blow against a thin flat piece of wood called a reed which vibrates and makes sound examples of reed instruments include saxophones and clarinets the meaning with this interpretation is similar to the the first meaning that i said earlier basically you can't just lay down as life blows against you when you're the king because reeds lay people blow against them so on and so forth okay fourth meaning the fourth meaning of this line is sexual I'm not going to explain the details of how, but if you're grown and you think about the line for a second, you get where I'm going with it. The point is, yet again, being king is not just about indulging in carnal sensual pleasures. You actually have to lead the people. Furthermore, given that Scar was so selfish and lazy, I got the vibe that he'd be a pillow princess. If you don't know what that is, you can 
Google it. Instead of being a giver in the bedroom, or you just use context clues. So it fits from that angle as well, because that is not king behavior. Sorry, not sorry. True kings don't act like that. This also acts as a reference to the deleted scene from The Lion King, where Scar tries to seduce Nala. Yes, this is an actual thing. I'm not kidding. Where Scar tries to seduce Nala, and when she isn't interested, he banishes her, which is what led Nala to end up in the jungle where she finds that Simba is still alive in the first place. So that is the fourth meaning, or I guess fifth meaning. You, I mean, you could argue that that's two separate things right there. Like, don't be a horny bastard, actually the people. And also, hey, this is also a reference to a deleted scene that you probably don't know about unless you're a nerd like me. Last but not last, keep the balance. This protects all, no matter what their breed. In this life, we're running together just like a stampede. A stampede is a situation in which a group of animals suddenly starts running in the same direction, especially because they are excited or frightened. This line means that we may all be different, but we're all moving in the same direction together. This line also acts as both a nod to the fact that these songs and projects are inspired by animals, as well as a reference to the scene of Mufasa's death via trampling during a stampede which totally didn't traumatize me as a kid. But that is Amari Volume 2, Leon. Thank you so much for watching these videos. I really, really do appreciate it. Um, hopefully you came away having learned something new or, or gotten a new perspective on some of the lines, songs, the project as a whole, etc. I am already working on Volume 3. Uh, hopefully it will be even better than this one is. So uh, definitely make sure to stick around for that. Uh, and again, Thank you for checking these videos out. I'll be seeing all of you guys here on the channel and on whatever streaming service that you listen to me on in the future. Have a great day. Peace. Sit back, don't stress, don't stress. Life is too short for